I'm sorry that you don't feel comfortable being a kept woman. I do. Keep me. I want an easy life. I want to be tender. I want to be loved. There's nothing wrong with going through a season of being cared for. And I think sometimes as black women, we don't even know how to allow that to happen. And then other black women will be like, oh, out of fear, like, oh, there's, there's something wrong with that. But our Caucasian counterparts do it all the time. And they are allowed to have seasons where they sit back and relax and explore other things and talents and gifts. And when we do it, we, we have to take on the burden of, but where is the labor? Hey, everyone. Welcome back to Flourish in the Forn, the award-winning podcast that elevates, celebrates, and affirms the voices and stories of Black women living and thriving abroad. I'm your host, Christine Job, a Black American woman currently based in Spain. And although I am an award-winning podcaster, I love saying that. I'm going to keep on saying that. I am also a business strategist that helps Black women and women of color leverage their talents and their expertise into viable and sustainable businesses that make them financially abundant and also professionally filled while pursuing thriving lives abroad. If you are interested in building your very own business abroad, definitely check out the website flourishintheforeign.com to pick up the Build a Business Abroad guide. And while you're on the website, definitely check out the resources page where you can find other great resources to help you get, stay, and thrive abroad. So as I said before, we are an award-winning podcast. Yes, I'm still reflecting upon that, and I'm going to keep on saying it until it really sinks in. And as y'all all all know, that this award-winning podcast is a labor of love. It is. But y'all know it. It's labor. Nonetheless, it is labor. And so I would like to invite you all to please support this here podcast. You can become a patron of this podcast at patreon.com slash flourish foreign. You can buy me a coffee at buymeacoffee.com slash flourish foreign. You can cash app the podcast at dollar sign flourish foreign. You can purchase a piece of podcasting equipment for me. Would love that via the Amazon wish list, which you can find on the website flourishintheforeign.com slash support. Now, I'm actually going to be unveiling other ways for you to support this here podcast. I am bringing to you all a membership that I'm really excited about. It'll be a paid membership, a community for all of you. And I'm really excited to do that for us to get to know each other and to bring really interesting guests to you guys. I really enjoy connecting you all with these incredible people and stories and places. Another way for you to support this here podcast and support me is definitely by purchasing the Moving Abroad with Intention course. If you are on your Moving Abroad journey, and this is if you are an expat or a repat, I've had both take this course and find immense value from it. If you're looking to go abroad with intention, meaning you want to ensure that the decisions that you're making are really in alignment with your vision of a life well lived, your vision of the next chapter of your life, I really encourage you to take the Moving Abroad with Intention course and definitely pick up the Moving Abroad with Intention guide where it has over 40 pages of journal prompts to really help you Get in tune with what you want, right? Because, you know, you can ask people in the internet where you should move and how you should go about things. But truly, at the end of the day, the answers to the big questions are definitely inside of you and you have to make that decision. No one on the internet can tell you 
what country is the best country to educate your child or anything like that. These are questions that you have to really answer for yourself by defining what best, good education, place, whatever it is that you are trying to figure out, you need to really define that for yourself. You have to define what success and what living abroad and living a life well lived looks like for you. No one else can tell you that and no expat list can tell you the best place for you to live. Like it doesn't work that way. So if that's of interest to you, go to the website flourishintheforeign.com and pick up the guide and also join the course. All right, on to the next episode. Today's guest is the fantastic Juanita of the critically acclaimed and super popular Amazon Prime TV show, The Expats International Ingrams. And I'm super excited to share this interview with y'all because Juanita is also a Southern woman. So she definitely has my heart for that. She shares her experience moving abroad through a corporate move and as a trailing spouse and as a mother in a way that I think is very relatable. She speaks about isolation and loss of identity and how she was able to turn it around, I think, is very inspirational. But I will let her tell you all about it. I am Juanita Ingram. I am located currently in Taiwan, uh, moving to Singapore next month, and I am 44 years old. So I grew up in Chattanooga, Tennessee. It's where I'm originally from. And typical upbringing, my mom was a teacher of 32 years. My dad is in administration at the university in Chattanooga, UT Chattanooga. And I grew up pretty typical. I did not have any real foreshadowing that I would live abroad. I think I was a part of a program called Inroads that gives inner city youth opportunities for internships. And that opportunity took me to New Jersey and New York to intern. And it was that experience of just moving away from where I grew up and moving out of Tennessee and out of Chattanooga and seeing bigger cities and different places. I think that was my first taste of leaving the nest, if you will. But I did not travel abroad until my honeymoon, until I was 27 years old was the first time that I really left the country. I mean, I went to like cruises to Cozumel and Aruba. But other than that, (laughs) not really leaving the United States until my honeymoon. And I just had this feeling. We were planning our wedding. And our family was like, why can't you guys go to Florida or go to Punta Cana or someplace normal? (laughs) And I had a feeling at that time that we were going to be required or called to live abroad. And so I talked to my husband at the time and told him, I think we need to travel abroad and start traveling abroad. And that was the first time that we did that. We went to Rome and Florence for our honeymoon and then committed every year on our anniversary after that to travel to a new place outside of the U.S. And I think those experiences, we did Spain, we did Paris, I think it was definitely those experiences that laid the groundwork for us to feel comfortable and confident to live abroad when the time came. I asked Juanita to walk me through her journey abroad. So I am what they call a trailing spouse. (laughs) And we moved abroad for my husband's job. And one day he came home and said, the company wants me to live in London. It was actually our first international stint. And actually before that, he had been asked to move to Poland for a period of time, but I was pregnant with my son at the time and I was on bed rest. (laughs) And I told him, yeah, now is not the time. So we kind of prolonged it. And then the second opportunity came and we lived in London. That was in 2011. And it was for his job. You have different types of expats, people that travel abroad for school, for education, because they want to get away. And some that are corporate expats as we are that move for work. And so he came home. And again, we had traveled uh, quite a bit throughout Europe. And those experiences really 
set the tone for us being able to know that we could live there. And they sent us to what they call on a, on a look-see and house hunting trip to look around and see where we were going to live and pick out a home. And before you knew it, I, I quit my job and traditional role as an attorney. And our two kids came obviously with us and there we were in London. And the journey of being an expat and a trailing spouse began. I was curious to know what Juanita's family thought of her and her husband and her kids moving to London. Oh, it was mixed, mixed reactions. I love everybody in my family. Some people were really excited and some people didn't really think that it was a good idea. You know who you are. I'm not going to call any names. You get the typical, especially being from the South. And I think it's a generational difference sometimes, not to stereotype any particular generation. I'll speak specifically to my family and the difference in generations. Some people in, in different generations, they just don't travel abroad in that way. And I didn't come from a family. To this day, I don't know that either one of my parents have ever left the United States. And I don't believe that they have. And so it was an uh, <laughs> interesting conversation sometimes. Like initially, and you can be a trailing spouse domestically and uh, internationally. My first experience being a trailing spouse was when I left Chattanooga and moved to Indianapolis, Indiana for my husband's job. And so my family was already giving him the side eye because he took me from Tennessee to Indiana away from them. And then and then here comes this bigger move. And in hindsight, I think they're very proud, really excited for us. They're very much used to it. When we told them a couple of months ago, hey, we'll be leaving Taiwan and going to Singapore next. I think they just probably think at this point that that's what we're just going to continue to do and there's no big deal. But the initial conversation was a little rough. Sometimes people don't understand change or don't understand how to navigate change. And you do have to be a little bold and confident in your ability to navigate change in order to step out and be bold enough to pursue living so far from where you're from, your network of support, your network of people that you know, your tribe. It takes a lot of confidence. It's, it's isolating at times with family, people and, and family and friends and colleagues, legal colleagues. People tend to project. They project their fears. They project their apprehension. They project the fact that they may want to do it, but don't, I won't say find the confidence, but just haven't found the opportunity or the avenue to do that. And so whether it was family or I had a lot of legal colleagues that thought I was crazy and flat out told me they thought I was crazy <laughs> to uh, quit my job. At the time I was in-house counsel at Rolls Royce and they thought that I was crazy to quit my job and go to London where I knew no one had no opportunities or job prospects. And the question became always, well, what are you going to do? We know this is for your husband, but what does this mean for you? And I think some people in my family had the same question because you watch someone matriculate through law school and they're on this particular path in their career. And then you have to take a step to the side and reinvent yourself. And people are afraid for you. They're afraid to do it themselves. And so they tend to project a lot of their fears onto you. And it it affected me from a career standpoint, not from a personal standpoint, because I'm very clear on the type of wife that I want to be, the type of mother that I want to be. And to, for me, marriage is a partnership. It is about supporting one another, supporting each other's dreams. And every move came with a promotion for my husband. So it wasn't a bad decision for us as a family. But I think people were genuinely concerned about, okay, you have worked really hard. You went to undergrad with an accounting degree. You graduated from law school, JD, MBA, you passed the bar in not one, but two states. And now what they felt like, now you're about to step away from all that and give all that up. And that's, you know, how some people really digest change is not a metamorphosis and it's not transitioning. It's just literally a cutoff. And so you have to really drown out the different voices and narratives. And, you know, everybody's really coming from a genuine place 
so they feel. They're coming from a genuine place of concern. But I'm a firm believer that you know God has a plan for everybody. And sometimes he doesn't share that plan with everybody. It's not a conference call. It's an individual calling. <laughs> so everybody isn't always privy to what God is doing in your life or in your marriage or in your career. I asked Juanita to describe to me her first year in London. The first year was a big change, big adjustment. Like I said, the first four months, really the first quarter almost of of our move, I really spent in a place of, I won't say constant sadness because London is an amazing place. It's just beautiful. It's a lot of great things to do. We lived in a wonderful area. We were out in Ascot, which is near the race courses. If you've ever seen the movie My Fair Lady, that's where we were living. It was beautiful. It was great for us as a family. My children were so young at the time. My son was 15 months old. My daughter was three. They didn't really care where we were living. My son was still breastfeeding. As long as the me and the milk were there, he could care less. So, you know, when you move with younger kids... It's a bit easier in regards to their transition because you are, you're their world. So it doesn't really matter where you plant that world at, you're it. So I think for them, it was great. For my husband, it was great. For me, it was a bit of a struggle. I'd say the first four to six months, I had all of these narratives in my mind of people questioning me, legal colleagues looking at me and saying, are you, are you sure about this? You were on a trajectory of uh, a certain way in your career, a certain path in your career. This seems, what are you going to do? Or what are you going to do for work? And I think we just, especially as Black women, we haven't normalized being kept women or being, you know, in the sense of taking a break and self-discovery and giving ourselves permission to say, it's okay that I'm not working every day right now. And the internal work that I'm doing on myself is work. And being a full-time mom or being a full-time stay-at-home wife or not having to define ourselves through labor, but just normalizing just being for us as Black women, I think that was a very big hurdle for me because of the voices and the narrative that I'd heard for so long growing up and equating my identity, my self-worth to what I did. And letting that define who I was, as opposed to really defining who I am and then doing. And so I went on that sort of self-discovery journey. And the first year was rough for me, but I made it through. I did not know at the time that that's what I was navigating through, but I got a life coach and it made all the difference. It really did. And it was like it just turned in a 180 degree once I got clarity and gave myself permission to be all that I wanted to define myself to be, not anybody else, not everybody else, not family, not colleagues, not friends, but everything that I wanted to define myself to be. And I discovered talents that I had shoved down that were there for years. I had books written inside of me that I didn't have the time to write. Now I did. I had acting skills that I put on the back burner. I started out in theater as a child and just adulted. And I got signed in London. Just a whole world opened up when I let it. I wanted to know what Juanita's experience was being a Black American woman in London. Back then, we didn't have all of the affinity groups that they have now. So like now you have brothers and sisters affinity groups on Facebook and almost every country or in every city. So there's brothers and sisters of Taiwan, brothers and sisters of Japan. I'm in three affinity groups already for Singapore and I haven't even moved there yet. And I've met, you know, so many supportive black women and people in different areas. When we lived in London, however, it was um, a, an intentional effort and it just was really happenstance. So you join like American clubs and women in London, you know, American women in London and different groups. But a lot of the expat groups are very white and there's nothing wrong with that. And so you you make friends there. But you, I think you always, or at least I do, long for a tribe of people that look like you, that have related experiences like you. And we found that church was a great avenue to make those connections back then. And it started there. And then we just met a couple of people that were living in the same area as us who were African-American 
And then from there, it just grew. I remember one time we were in a convenience store and my husband was on an aisle with the kids. My children looked just like him as though I wasn't even involved. And we heard this woman walk by and she said, oh, them kids look just like him. And it was her accent and it was the way she said it and our heads turned and we chased her down like, hey, you sound like you're, you're an American. You know, and we started having um, these monthly events called Soul Food Sunday. And we would have like a potluck dinner and it just started to grow. We were inviting maybe four or five couples, black couples, and then it grew to about 35 people and we would rotate houses and we really organically grew our tribe at that time and just being in different areas, like I said, church and then word of mouth and one person would meet another person and they would come along the next month. And so it grew organically in that way. So the Ingrams stayed in London for two years and then repatriated back to the United States. So I asked Juanita what the repatriation experience was like for her and her family. So repatriation is a journey in and of itself. And it can be isolating as well because when you move back, People don't really want to hear about your experiences. Some people that have traveled or lived abroad, they do. But for the most part, you feel very alone. You feel like you've had this great experience that you want to tell everybody about. And then you quickly learn when people ask you, so how was it living there? They have about 8.5 seconds that they really want to hear about it. And all they really want to hear is, oh, it was nice. It was fun. We traveled. It was great. Great. And they move on. And so it could be isolating. In the sense that you have these experiences and stories to share and you don't really have an avenue except for other people who have done the same to have conversations about things that people cannot relate to. And I think it's the fact that there's no relatability sometimes to what you've experienced, people who have traveled, but not. it's a difference between traveling and living abroad as well, which is the reason why you know I had the concept for the show, because there are a lot of travel vlogs and travel shows but what about living abroad? And it's different. It's very different. So repatriation was, it was interesting. I think we both knew that we kind of outgrew Indiana while we were in London in many respects. And I say that with all due respect, but it is okay to feel and to acknowledge that you've outgrown a particular area for various reasons. And sometimes it's because when you're in such a diverse place like London, where there are so many different ethnicities and nationalities and races that are prevalent to go back to an environment that's very homogeneous, not only in racial makeup, but also in culture and mentality. It can feel a little like like you're, you're just standing on the outside of a fishbowl. You're kind of looking at the fishbowl like, oh, that, that's a nice fishbowl, but it looks a little small for me now. And it felt that way. And I think sometimes we're not honest enough to admit that it feels that way. And it did. And so it was a, it was interesting. It was good to be home in many regards as well. There's no place like home sometimes, the conveniences of the U.S. But then at the same time, there are definitely aspects of going back to America that are stressful. I went back to a corporate attorney role that was extremely stressful because I think we are I wasn't able to really exist authentically in the corporate America setting. There's a lot of code switching that has to happen. You know, everything that we've been talking about for the last year in terms of how stressful it is to be in America and be Black and the effect on mental health and wellness and all of these things that have come to the forefront in the last year that have been in existence for years is something that you definitely experience. I think for the kids, it was great. They got to reunite with friends and family. And again, every time we moved, it was for a promotion for my husband. So it was good. When we moved back, it was because he was being promoted. We went from great to great professionally. And I enjoyed the traditional practice of law again. But I did feel like at this point, there was a duality. So I was still acting. I started producing, launched my own production company because of the breakthrough in acting that I had experienced while we were living in London. So I had my first agency to sign me, my first opportunity to act in an independent feature movie, my first nomination for 
Best Actress from the British Urban Film Festival. And so I, I had already tapped into these other skills and giftings. And so it was interesting to have to navigate both worlds once we returned. So during their time back in the States, Juanita's husband received another offer to go abroad and they began to film their wildly popular TV show, The Expats International Ingrams. And so I asked Juanita to really go through the origin story of the TV show. I had the vision for the docuseries when we were living in London, when we were doing Soul Food Sundays. And one day we were celebrating a couple that was actually moving back to the United States. And there were about 30 of us that were at the Soul Food Sunday that day. Frankie Beverly Mays was playing. Beyonce was playing. And everybody was outside barbecuing and kids were running on the lawn. And I looked up and in the background, there was Windsor Castle because we were actually in the district of Windsor. And I thought to myself, you know, I, I, there hasn't been any depiction of this type of life and transition what third culture kids go through. So we were back in Indiana. We moved back in 2016. And in 2018, they let us know late 2018 that we were getting ready to start moving uh, toward Taiwan. And so in late 2018, that's when we started rolling the cameras. And then by mid-2019, we were already in Taiwan. That journey, that experience you know, you just have to be open to change. Obviously, this time I was already flourishing, if you will, um, in all of my other skills and giftings and using my law degree in a different way. I launched my 501c3 production company. And so for me, it was very purposeful in moving to Taiwan. I knew that we were going to do this show and I knew that we wanted to get the authentic moments of living abroad and being Black and abroad that had never been shown. So it was exciting. It was a lot of work. It was fun. It was fun for the kids, but yet still a lot of heavy lifting on their end because Taiwan is not London. And when you add in the mix of a real language barrier, that is a real foreign experience and a different foreign experience than what we had the first time, but one that's been very rewarding And I think it's made us stronger as a couple, as a family. I asked Juanita to describe to me what was it like arriving in Taiwan and what that first year was like. Yeah, it was it was great. And it was challenging at the same time because we moved here. And by the end of our first four months here, we were in COVID. So the first four months were great. And after that, here comes COVID. So we spent the first year really dealing with that from August 2019 is when we landed in Taiwan. And by the end of December through January, COVID whispers were around because we sit 84 miles outside of China. So COVID came to us first. We were schools closed and we were doing the whole social distancing and flattening the curve in February of 2020. So to experience that, and it's all in the show and, you know, showing how that all played out here, it was beautiful in the beginning. It was beautiful in the middle of it because it brought us together as a family through faith and just seeing how Taiwan was really on the forefront. I mean, who knew? You you think about shows and as a producer, as a creative producer, and even just a storyteller, you always want to do something that's different. You always want to tell a story or show something that hasn't been shown before. And in reality TV, so often people have and have experienced shows with a particular formula for entertainment. And I'm I'm a firm believer there's a show for everybody. And I love all reality, all unscripted, unstructured television shows. I think that's great. And they a lot of things have laid the blueprint for our show. I just knew that there was enough drama in everyday life and relatability in drama and challenges and overcoming obstacles and celebrating in normalizing Black people, Black families, Black educators, Black professionals in these foreign settings, that we didn't need contrived storylines or negative drama formulas of Black people arguing with with each other between COVID and typhoons and kids not getting into school and language barriers and cultural barriers and Black Lives Matter Taiwan. It was so much that was going on that first year that we had a great show, but in, in experiencing that, 
it was it was overwhelming at times, but yet again, it just brought us together as a family. And I think for me being a, a spiritual person, I definitely know why God sent us to Taiwan. Up until up until recent, up, up until this last month, we were like 200 and plus days with zero COVID cases, local cases. So we were on the forefront and like the blueprint of how to flatten the curve and to be able to depict that and how life was here was helpful, I think, to many and encouraging. And now we're actually in the middle of filming season two. We're actually in lockdown right now in Taiwan. So we we kind of went in reverse in this last month. We've had like 10,000 new cases thanks to this one interesting rogue pilot who did not stay in quarantine for the amount of time that he should have and came out and went to a lot of places. And so we're actually going through a soft lockdown right now, but we'll we'll get it under control. Uh, we don't have vaccines because there was no real rush to get that when we didn't have COVID cases. So we'll we'll get on the other side of it. But to be able to to depict that in season two has been something that has been, I think, will be relatable to audiences as well because I think everybody has experienced it, and now it's our turn. And uh, it's been an amazing journey, just as an independent indie filmmaker and a black woman working with what is at times an all male crew in the middle of Taiwan <laughs> has been a journey in of us. So we could do a podcast on that alone. Hey, I hope that you are enjoying this episode of Flourish in the Foreign. And if you are, please consider supporting the podcast by either becoming a Patreon subscriber at patreon.com slash flourish foreign, tipping the podcast via cash app at dollar sign flourish foreign, or buy me a coffee at buymeacoffee.com slash flourish foreign, or purchasing a piece of production equipment via our Amazon wish list at flourishintheforeign.com slash support. I also want to invite you all to check out the plethora of resources that I have compiled for you all at the website flourishintheforeign.com slash resources. There you will find a book list to help you get, stay, and thrive abroad, as well as the build a business abroad guide and moving abroad with intention guide. All right. Let's continue the show. So Juanita has two children, and I'm always curious about what kids really think about moving abroad and living abroad. And so I asked her to describe to me what her kids' experiences have been like. Yeah, I think it's been a great experience for them definitely has. And it's interesting because on the show, they start out, we started rolling cameras again in 2018 and debuted in 2020. So the kids that you see on the show have grown by three years and that growth is beautiful to watch. Definitely being a third culture kid, because this is their third continent, third country. Singapore will be their fourth country that they've lived in. I just visited, they visited like 27 countries. And so to see them see the world and see the world through their eyes and then to see them grow in a way that I certainly didn't have the opportunity. I think the world is small to them. I asked my daughter not too long ago, where do you feel like you're from? Because for me as an African-American, people ask me, where are you from? I'm quick to say, oh, I'm, I'm from Chattanooga, Tennessee. I still go on class reunion trips with my high school classmates. I'm very close to Chattanooga. I I still own businesses there and houses there and stuff. And I'm very, very connected to where I'm from. With third culture kids, it's been interesting to see their maturation of where they feel rooted. When we moved back from London to Indiana, my son had a full British accent. That was his first accent. He never had an American accent. Uh, Because he was learning to speak and we were living in the UK, he was so young. And when I told him that he was from, I I took him to the pediatrician's office. He was about five, almost six. And we were walking in the hospital and and I said, yeah, KJ, this is where you were born here. And he stopped and looked at me and he was like, really, mommy? Yeah. You know, he just kind of looked around like, oh my gosh. He was like, really? In this this location? And I'm like, yes, KJ. And he was like, son, I'm not 
British. And I'm like, no, I've been trying to tell you for the longest time and explain your nationality that you are American. But I asked my daughter recently, where do you feel like you are from? And she said, I feel like I'm from everywhere. I feel like I am just as much from the UK as I am from the US. I don't really remember being in the US before the UK, but I know that I was there. I feel connected to Taiwan because this is where she, my daughter's 13 now. So she went through her preteen years and into her teenage years right here in Asia and feels very much connected. They don't see uh, race the same, although they do experience issues of race in similar ways. There are a lot of microaggressions that occur in a lot of Asian countries, and Taiwan is no different, that they certainly do experience. But at the same time, they've grown up in this freedom of identity and being able to really come into their own. And it is a benefit and a blessing. I do not worry about my daughter going to the mall and worrying whether or not a security guard is going to you know, draw a gun on her or whether or not the police are going to mishandle her. I don't have that fear. And that's not to say that she won't experience being followed in the store or someone uh, falsely accusing her of something, but she's not going to die. I don't have that fear and neither does she and neither does my son. That has been refreshing and a blessing. We talked about that. I think it was episode 12, a scene that I'm very proud of. My husband and another gentleman here who's African-American and was from Alabama, California, former NBA player, Taiwanese NBA player, but he's black and is a full Taiwanese citizen now, gave up his U.S. citizenship. But he and my husband had this beautiful conversation as black men about how they felt safer outside of the U.S. than at home, especially right now. And I think that's a reality for children as well. It's been beautiful to watch them pick up extra languages. My son is becoming fluent in Mandarin. My daughter has chosen uh, Spanish, but she's also picked up Mandarin and Spanish. She'll concentrate on Spanish when we move to Singapore. But to see them pick up another language and just to see them experience cultures and friends from different cultures in various places. They have friends all over the world. They still keep in contact with their friends and they went to school with them in London. And they're everywhere from Switzerland to Portugal right now to Brazil. And this is their network. This is their squad, if you will. That's been beautiful to watch. It's been hard and I have to let go of the the upbringing that I had. I, I had a Zoom recently on my 25th high school reunion and I looked on the Zoom and most of the faces on there I had known since I was two years old, three years old, elementary school, middle school. I'd known these people my entire life. Some of them even, we even went to college together. Like it was, it's that kind of network and that kind of extended family that sometimes I worry if they're going to have that, but they have something else. That is different and that's beautiful. And I fully know that one day they'll be, oh, I'm going to New Zealand to this person's wedding that I've known since middle school. And that's their reality, their world. So it's been beautiful to watch. It's interesting in season two where we're filming right now, certain life skills, however, I needed to convey to them. Because, you know, I grew up in a time every Saturday, my mom would turn on Luther Vandross' vinyl album and Hall and Oates. And by the time she got to Whitney Houston, all the chores need to be done. So my sister would vacuum, I would mop. Somebody would end us, somebody would Windex. And that was our Saturday mornings. They never had that. They don't know anything. They don't know about their life. They've always had helpers and housekeepers and all that. And then during this lockdown, when our, our helpers and housekeepers weren't coming, I noticed, I was like, I don't think my kids know how to wash clothes. And, and that's all on me. So certain life skills that you have to be intentional about because you're living in a particular setting that you have to make sure that you give them the life skills to know that helpers are not going to always be there to do their laundry. And that that's totally on me, not on them. And so those are the type of things that I'm cognizant of now that Kinsley's 13 and she only has like five years left and she should go off to college knowing how to do her own laundry. That is the goal. So, <laughs> but it's been great. It really has been great. So during the first season of the TV show, We see Juanita and her husband go through an ordeal, really, to register their kids in school in Taiwan before they even arrive. Due to a rogue teacher recommendation, 
So I asked Juanita to really speak more about finding a school abroad for her children. And as they now move to Singapore, what that process has been like trying to register them in international schools in Singapore. You see in the show the challenges we had in getting into the American schools here in Taiwan. I think internationally, the international school experience is different for every country. And we talked about that in the show, and we talk about that even more so. I do an eight-part series called Trailing Spouses that's on um, YouTube right now with another friend, a uh, trailing spouse mom who's a diplomat from an African country here. And her child is also in an international school. And we talk about the difference in education and the pursuit of education and trying to pick a school that's that's uh, right for your child. And sometimes you don't really have a lot of options when you move abroad and there's a different approach. So what my experience was in the UK, especially in London, you're registering your kids. I mean, yes, you're applying, but it's more of a registration. Asia and, and there's a educational lawyer that was on the show that talked about just how hard it is to get your children into international and American schools on the Asian continent. It is a different approach. It's a different process. You are applying to school. I felt like I was launching my kids to college. You know, it was it's really an application process and it's not guaranteed. There's sometimes there are space accommodation issues. And so we tried to pick a school when we approached this with and learning from our experiences from London versus Taiwan. I approached Singapore much differently. I didn't leave room for the ambiguous teacher recommendation. I had strong conversations with people beforehand, like, look, in case you've never done a recommendation for a child that's going into another Asian country, which they had, because I think that makes a big difference as well. We were coming from Indiana to Taiwan, and there's a difference. They don't understand what these recommendations are really like. And so you put something in there that's negative because you're having a moment. You could really jeopardize that child's trajectory into school. But this time around going into Singapore, my kids did get into both of the top two international American schools in Singapore. We had our pick this time of options. And so they're already accepted. They're there. And when we looked at the two different schools, we honestly looked at their diversity numbers. And Singapore really is like the London of Asia is what people say. It's very diverse. There are schools there that had a lot of diversity and some that didn't. And we looked at curriculum. We looked at where kids go on to matriculate to after they leave the school. But really looking at the balanced experience that they're going to have in the environment and making sure that they're not the only ones of color there. So there's a less likelihood of unconscious bias. That's not to say that it won't exist. If their existence in children that look like them have been normalized because there are more of them. That played a big, significant uh, factor in our decision this time around. And I think we owe it to our kids to give them that experience, that they are happy and supported and that their existence has been normalized prior to them getting there. So that was a big factor in what we use to make a decision and the strength of the curriculum. We want them to be prepared to enter into whatever school that they will go on to after here, after this assignment will probably be in the New Jersey, New York area. And you just want your kids to be prepared. So that was that played a heavy part in our decision making. You see a lot of that in season two. So there are actually a lot of Black people, uh, a lot more than I thought would be showcased on her TV show. So I asked Juanita if there was a vibrant Black community in Taiwan. Yes, I think the Black community in Taiwan is very diverse, much more than you probably would even expect. And that was the beauty of the opportunity we had in the show to show, yes, we are corporate expats. That's the path that we took. That's the path that led us here. That's how we got here. But I was very intentional in wanting to show the path of other Black people. So you had teachers, students who came to be in Taiwan, everyone from actors to activists. And it's very diverse here. And even more so in season two, we have people and pulling in friends of the show, folks who are from everywhere, from the diaspora, who are doing so many amazing things. And I really wanted to showcase 
some of the outstanding works and things that we are doing in these international spaces. And that we do that a lot in season one, certainly beefed it up even in season two, but diverse in what we're doing and who we are and how, and what led us to be here and how we got here. And I wanted to show the variety of pathways because I didn't want people to think, oh, well, if I'm not with a company, I have no hope of making that journey, even though I think it's interesting and maybe something that I want to do. I wanted to show people. We have one person like Zoe who who had a particular major and came here to teach. Another person like Toy who majored in Chinese and lived in China for a while and came as a student and then stayed and migrated here and stayed. You have people like Ali, who is not only an educator, but also an activist. And so people like Jean-Paul, who came here and decided to pursue the arts and education and is a trained ballet dancer and worked for years as an advocate and activist for Haiti and is part Haitian, part African-American. And so they come from a variety of different settings. Jewel is another Southern girl like myself who came over just for a visit, just vacationing and decided to stay. And these are the realities and the various different pathways. And then we had my trailing spouse tribe and they were all trailing spouses that came over with their spouse as well. I wanted to depict the different pathways um, of getting here and the beauty of each journey that can lead to living abroad. I was curious to know how living abroad has affected Juanita and her husband's marriage. I think it definitely has enhanced it. I mean, there were definitely trying times because like my stint of having like trailing spouse syndrome and trailing spouse depression, that was really rough on us as a couple. And any form of depression or search of identity is your process is going to process the other person. And being abroad is doesn't make your marriage exempt to any of the natural maturation processes that you go through when you've been married for a long time. Like we've been married for 16 years. Every marriage goes through ups and downs and ebbs and flows. I think being abroad enhances that feeling because you are isolated from sometimes from what would be your community. It's made us stronger as a couple because in essence, we really are all we have. <laughs> and so you have to redefine gender roles, redefine what works for you and making sure that you are comfortable and give yourself permission to define and have the marriage that works for you because you cannot adopt what other people are doing in their marriage, especially if they are not similarly situated. I, I will admit, I can be a little extra. I'm not, I'm not everybody's cup of tea and people don't always, in the beginning, especially when I was stepping out into these different giftings, People didn't get it. They were like, oh, she seems, is she having a midlife crisis? And I'm like, well, first of all, I'm only, you know, 32. You don't have a midlife crisis at 32. Um, and so what you have is growth. And people, you when you grow in a marriage, each person grows. And sometimes people that meet you, friends of your spouse or family, they meet you at a particular place and they don't understand growth. Maybe they're not growing. Maybe they have a witness growth. Growth is something that I think is inevitable when you live abroad. And so it challenged us as a couple. And once we really both accepted and understood that we had to define our own marriage and what worked for us and how my husband was going to support my endeavors. And now he's like, I call him my sugar daddy because he's my number one sponsor. He's my number one fan. And so we had to grow to that place. Because you do have outside chatter and narratives like, oh, why does your wife have to do this? And why is she doing that? And that seems a little bit strange. It's not strange. It's me. It may be strange for your wife, but I'm not your wife. And so, you know, you have to really be confident in having your own marriage and not worrying about how other people see you. I remember one time we had a couple that was very close to us. And the wife came to me one time and just said, you know, I really think you ought to stop everything that you're doing because we were having a very rough period in our marriage. I say very rough. I had started acting. My, my husband didn't marry a wife that was an actress. Although I was an actor before I met him, I wasn't acting when I met him. I was a lawyer. That took some time for him to get used to. And in that time, his friend's wife reached out to me and said, you know, I really feel like God wants you to stop everything you're doing. You should just stop. 
stop acting, stop everything. She was saying it with like tears in her eyes, like really convicted. And I just knew that no shade, it wasn't from God. Like, first of all, God's not going to tell you something that he hadn't told me. He might confirm a thing through somebody else, but he's not going to tell you something that he hasn't told to me. And again, people project. They project their fears. They project their limitations. And maybe because somebody else is limited in their role and how they operate as a wife, they wanted me to be limited as such. And at the time, it was concerning. It was, you know, I was like, oh my gosh, this couple was very close to us. And when she said this, I was like, oh my gosh, this is kind of crazy. But I think you have to know and be very confident in what you are called to do. And so does your spouse. Your spouse, you have to be really firmly rooted in knowing that you both individually have a calling and that I am his wife, I am their mother, and I was more than that the day that they met me. I will be more than that all the days of my life. And that is okay. And in fact, it's great. And so when we started celebrating and not stifling and really encouraging and not discouraging based on other people's definition of what life should look like. Our life is not ordinary in many regards, and nor should it be. It's exciting. It's great. Once we really start accepting how great things were and not letting other people define it, we are where you see us in the show. That is a process. It was a journey in getting there. And I'm so grateful that we've landed in that place because he really is my number one fan and I am his number one fan. I am his number one supporter. I would give up. And I don't even feel like I gave up being a lawyer. I just decided to be a lawyer in a different way. And that was a personal journey. And sometimes you'll have people that will challenge your personal journey. Like I don't, I had to do the research and figure out how many lawyers are out there doing other things. I don't think Iyala Van Zandt misses a day in the courtroom. A lot of people don't even know Iyala was a lawyer. Gandhi, Barack Obama, Nelson Mandela, all of these lawyers who are doing other things. But if you allow people to put you in a particular lane, that that limitation will spill over into the happiness within your marriage and your spouse can't allow other people to try to put their spouse in a box either. So you really have to be um, each other's best friend. You really have to understand what your relationship is for you. And when everybody else gets it twisted, you have to be very quick to say, you know what? This is what my husband, because people were like, you're crazy for quitting your job. And I'm like, I'm sorry that you don't feel comfortable being a kept woman. I do. Keep me. I want an easy life. I want to be tender. I want to be loved. There's nothing wrong with going through a season of being cared for. And I think sometimes as Black women, we don't even know how to allow that to happen. And then other Black women will be like, oh, out of fear, like, oh, there's, there's something wrong with that. But our Caucasian counterparts do it all the time. And they are allowed to have seasons where they sit back and relax and explore other things and talents and gifts. And when we do it, we we have to take on the burden of, but where is the labor? Can we relax? I mean, it's just black women, we it's just not normalized. And I'm really on this campaign of normalizing black women in luxury, black women in self-care, black women in, in wellness, black women in tenderness. Can we be soft? Can we relax? Can we have tenderness in our lives and be treated tenderly. That's why I really wanted to do the show and depict that because so often in unscripted TV, every Black woman has to have a struggle. Every Black marriage has to be, you know, on the brink of divorce. And that's not to say that that's not real and that isn't healing and encouraging to someone. But what about all of us who have worked through some really tough situations and now we're thriving and we're happy? Can we have hashtag happy black? So that's just where I'm at right now in, in trying to enjoy life because life is stressful enough. Juanita is a woman after my own heart. As someone who's a lawyer and doesn't practice, I find her and all of her ambitions extremely inspirational. And so I asked her, for all of y'all who may be interested in creating your own reality TV show, how exactly do you produce a reality TV show? I, I'm actually in the process of putting together a virtual workshop on this very topic because I think as an indie filmmaker and a creative producer, I don't have the backing of a major network. This is all self-funded, self-published, self-produced. 
And, you know, it was just me, my production partner at the time, and a camera and a spirit of excellence. I think you need to study. From a producer's perspective, you need to study. I started taking financing and film and film production courses, oh, I want to say two years before I even started this project, just to make sure that we did everything with the right level of industry standards and knowing what I was to know what I was doing. It's one thing to have a passion. It's another thing to have a skill set. I think you need to invest in yourself to turn that passion into skill and to really study and show thyself approved and to really hone your craft. Because the business of film and the business of television is just that. It's a business. And so having a JD and an MBA definitely helped in terms of my producing skills creativity comes, you know, something that can't be taught, but your skill level in execution is something that you can develop and getting a mentor. And and there's so much information out now. There are certain things that I have experienced that I think will be a blessing and a help to other people that are on this journey, even just filming through COVID. We've got so many hacks that we did, virtual directing and how to do certain things into the technical nuances of it. But I think for a person that's starting out, Enroll in a course of being a producer. Enroll in a course on um, sound, on lighting, on videography. You don't have to be a uh, jack of all trades and a scholar of none, but you do need to know every aspect of everyone on set. You need to know their job so that when someone tells you something is impossible, you either know that it really is or that they just don't know how to do it, but you still need to get it done. I think the biggest thing you can have as an independent creative uh, producer is tenacity and a real spirit of excellence. Our, I say our, our show right now is I'm blown away. We are on the ballot for the Emmys right now, the Television Academy. They are voting on who gets a nomination. We are on the ballot for Outstanding Unscripted Reality Program and three other categories as well. Just to be qualified. And we had to go through like an industry review with the Television Academy because we're on Amazon Prime, but we're not an Amazon original. So we this is fully saved my salary from my last year working as an attorney to, f- to fund this. I would say definitely get your budget in mind, learn how to line produce and, and know what it's going to take to really do things with a spirit of excellence. And our season one, it's not perfect, you know, but but neither is season one of any other reality show. So it's it's a natural progression that you get better and better each time. I can see the progression from a production perspective from episode one to episode 12 to episode 20. It just keeps getting better and better. I think honing your craft. I'm in acting classes every month. I'm in right now. I signed up for a certification with NYU Film School. I, there's a lot of things that I've done. In the background, I didn't just say, oh, I think I want to do this and just figured it out. And I think that's the misconception that people have that, oh, it just happened. Now you have to put out quality as best as you can, quality work, or else your message gets lost, your narrative gets lost, and it won't be perfect, but you have to continue to just push through and know that if you're truly called to do it, you'll find a way to get it done as an independent production company. There is so much to consider and there will be days when you feel like giving up. Don't. But I definitely think investing in your skill development. And if you want to be on a reality show, you need to make sure that you're interesting. There's a show for everybody. There is a formula for entertainment that every show adopts that's different. We happened to adopt edutainment, which was a phrase that the Black Panthers used back in the 70s that was a blend of educating and entertaining. But what we don't do is adopt the negative drama formula that a lot of reality shows have, especially when it comes to Black reality TV. That's just not something that I was interested in doing. One, because it's already been done and it's not unique. And two, I really feel like where we are as a people, not only dealing in a, a viral pandemic, but a racial pandemic as well. Living abroad is so profound and so dramatic when you don't need to make up storylines. And two, this is just a personal prep. I refuse to fight with Black people in an international setting. Now, that's not to say 
you're going to always get along. And even on our season, there was a cast member and I, we didn't see eye to eye on something. I don't have friends that flip tables and throw drinks though. So I just wanted to depict like a real way of conflict resolution that the black women that I know engage in because we're not a monolith. That's not to say we don't engage in throwing drinks and flipping tables because we do, but that's not all that we do. So I wanted to show the diversity and it's not just the same old, same old stereotype. We want to make sure that it's something that's unique, that's refreshing, that's entertaining, that's informational and inspiring. My production company is a 501c3 and our mission is to empower women and marginalized people through film. And so there are different categories of unscripted television and we're trying to forge our way through a new subcategory of smart reality docu-series that's really based in real life stories, real life drama, but that also really pushes positive images, real images of Black people and normalize that. I asked Juanita, what is her definition of wellness and how has living abroad changed that definition, that concept, that practice of wellness for her? Wellness to me is is so dimensional, like it's self-acceptance, it's self-care, it's self-love. It is permission of self to sit still, permission to take care of yourself and sometimes taking care of yourself is doing nothing because you need a break. It is all of those things. And over time it's evolved as I have evolved in really finding peace in the transition and peace in the new space in life, not just physically, but mentally in life that I'm in. I have intentional self-care routines, whereas before I just didn't have the time to even create them. There are also certain products and spas that you'll get in in areas like Taiwan and, you know, Vietnam, Philippines, uh, Malaysia, places that we've visited, Japan that have products and wellness uh, spas that you'll go to. And even medically, like I I went on and I actually have a follow up, this Western Eastern medicine blend of really treating symptoms and not just prescribing medication and being intentional about exploring that for my own health, which is a part of my wellness and things that I were experiencing in the U.S. that they were just treating symptoms, but not really trying to heal from a holistic perspective and really tapping in to that being here in Asia and that opportunity being so prevalent. I think intentional is the exact word. I'm intentional about giving myself facials, as intentional as I was before COVID and even during when we were in better days, we'll get there again. But of spa treatments, it doesn't always have to be something that you pay for, but finding the best products out here and exploring different things that take care of my skin in a new way and really just being intentional about giving the love that I need to myself first so that I'm not looking for it in other places, but I'm giving it to myself. To me, wellness is about love. It's about honoring yourself holistically. And I constantly do a check-in each way. In what ways have you honored yourself today? Sometimes it's honoring yourself. It's just acknowledging that you are privileged to walk. You are privileged to have the ability to move. So how dare you not exercise? And exercise doesn't have to be strenuous. But if you aren't walking every day, are you really, you know, neglecting the privilege that you have that you move? It's about having the space and the ability to even reflect, taking a pause in your life to have a different pace in life, to fully engulf love on yourself and not be apologetic about it. Because if you don't do it, who will? And you set the tone for whoever's trying to do it. You set the tone for what you want and what you expect by how you give it to yourself. So if other people are are neglecting you, you have to first ask, how did you neglect yourself? And that's, that's usually where the answer is. So that's how I approach wellness. Thank you so much, Juanita, for sharing your story. And if you want to keep up with Juanita, you can via social media. I am Juanita Ingram is my social media handle for all of my social media, Instagram, Facebook, Twitter. It's all I am Juanita Ingram. My website, I am Juanita Ingram dot com. They can find out about the show at the expats show dot com. It is also the social media handle. And if they want to watch the show, go to Amazon 
It's there in the U.S. and U.K. on Amazon Prime. If you have Prime membership, it's free to stream. And also, I have some exciting news. We're going to try to do our own platform for streaming for those who we have so many people living in so many different areas because the show is international that people in Brazil and Portugal are like, hey, I don't have a U.S. or a U.K. Amazon account. How can I see the show? So we're trying to broaden our distribution. We've signed with a new distributor that I can't talk about just yet, but watch the space on our websites and uh, uh, on our uh, social media that we'll make that announcement soon that we will be in more places with season one and season two. And so, yeah, they could just expatsshow.com or go to Amazon and stream it and watch it and leave a great review because the Academy is watching. We are up for, again, we're on the ballot for a possible nomination. Haven't gotten the nomination yet. They have to vote. And so, but just to be an Emmy qualified show is a big deal in our space, especially for shows that are trying to put forth positive images of of Black people in the unscripted genre. So yeah, I appreciate the support from so many people. We hit 2.3 million streams in less than a month. And so we really appreciate the support. Thank you so much, Juanita, for sharing your story with us all. And if you want to keep up with Juanita, you can by visiting her show notes page at flourishintheforeign.com slash Juanita. All right, y'all. We are winding down this season of Flourish in the Foreign, and I want to stay connected with you all. So be sure that you have joined the Flourish in the Foreign email list and get the newsletter so that you can be notified when the membership opens, our community opens, and we can stay in touch in the meantime, between time, between seasons. I can give you behind the scenes about crafting a podcast. What does it take to craft a podcast? Or at least What does it take to craft this here podcast? (laughs) Also, I want to remind you that I will not be offering my one-on-one moving abroad consultation services in 2022. So if you want to have a chat with me about your moving abroad journey, if you want to bounce ideas off of me, all of those things, and you want to do it, Uh, one-on-one, you want to be sure to book in some time to chat with me before the end of the year. My books are open, so you want to go ahead and do that. If you've been on the fence about it, I'm just telling you, you're going to want to do that. If you know of someone, or maybe perhaps it's you yourself, who would be an excellent guest on Flourish in the Foreign, I want to highly encourage you to go ahead and fill out the guest inquiry form that is on the website, flourishintheforeign.com slash contact. Be sure to fill out the guest inquiry form. Let me know all about you. Tell me why you want to be on the podcast. Be sure you've listened to the podcast because one way to not get on a podcast is to openly admit that you haven't listened to it. So be sure that you've listened to the podcast. Clearly, if you are hearing my voice, you've listened to the podcast, but make sure whoever you recommend says listen to the podcast. And I want to mention that I'm putting out a call for guest bloggers for the Flourish in the Foreign website. Yes. I am looking for some guest bloggers to really share their experiences living and thriving abroad, their wellness journeys abroad, and more. You can find out more information on how you can become a guest blogger for the website, and the link is in the description of this episode. Thanks so much to Zachary Higgs for producing the music of this here podcast. If you're in need of music for your next creative endeavor, he is definitely your guy. You can find all of his information in the show notes of this episode. And please remember that it's not about getting abroad. It's not about being abroad. It's about thriving abroad. So go abroad and cultivate a life well lived. See you next time. Bye. On the next episode of Flourish in the Foreign. In Southern, we have this expression that's called we're all not meat, which means that we're all 
we're all peers we're all dating each other so like you will find out you're dating x x is dating y and y and z are together just like what will smith and jada and august are going through i kid you not there are a lot of entanglements in that loan so you just have to be careful who you're getting involved with because some married men are just so overt and cheeky like you'd be like oh are you married and with their ring on their finger they're like yeah and 